By a show of hands, how many people think Percy should get to have ice cream for breakfast? <laughs> Good thing we don't get to decide. <laughs> Who is God? This is one of the timeless questions of our faith. Abraham and Sarah wrestle with the question when God promises them an heir that does not come for decades. They begin to wonder if God is a God that keeps covenant. They doubt as the years go by and take matters into their own hands, asking Hagar, their servant, to bear a child in their name rather than waiting for the child promised to come. But God is faithful, and Isaac is born. Hagar herself will ask the same question as she is eventually cast out of Abraham and Sarah's house due to Sarah's jealousy. When she ran out of water for her and her son Ishmael, she cried out to God, who responded. And she names God El Roy, or the one who hears. Moses asks the same question when God comes to him and tells Moses to go challenge Pharaoh and lead the Hebrew people out of slavery in Egypt. Who shall I say sent me? Moses asks. Yahweh, God responds, which is translated as, I am who I am, or simply, I am. While entirely true that God or Yahweh is all that is, all-encompassing, I am, this answer isn't entirely satisfying. When we are praying, when we are searching, when we are questioning, who is this God that we are reaching out to? This was one of the prime questions that brought me into church as a young adult. I didn't grow up going to church, although I had some experience in Sunday school as a child. But I reached a point in my adult life where I was really struggling with fundamental questions. Eric, my husband, and I had uh, miscarriages and infertility, and I desperately wanted a child, and that was not happening in my life. As I was consumed with grief, I was crying out to a God I didn't really know. And the world around me was telling me things about God that didn't feel true. Like, God is a God who will not give us more than we could handle. I can tell you that the years of miscarriages and infertility felt like more than I could handle. And so it didn't seem to be true that a loving God would give us more, never would ever give us more than we could handle, and yet would have given me what I was carrying. Or I was told, God is doing this to teach you a lesson. That left me with two options. Either I was such a terrible person that this is what I needed in order to learn, or God was so cruel that this is how God would teach. I needed to know who God is and was, and so I came to church. Early on, I encountered in 1 John this answer about who God is. God is love. Beautiful and true, but sometimes too ethereal and too intangible. What does it mean in the practical sense that God is love? That God is I am. That God is the one who hears or keeps covenant. In this parable of the unjust judge and the widow, Jesus is giving us a window into who God is by comparing or actually contrasting God to this unjust judge. If this judge who self-describes as having no fear of God, nor respect for people, I always think that's like a little funny part in the parable that maybe we're meant to laugh at, where Jesus says, the judge said to himself, I am an unjust judge who does not fear God or people. Who says that to themselves? <laughs> anyway... If this unjust judge will grant the widow's petition, how much more will our God do for God's people who cry out to God day and night? 
In this parable or story, we hear echoes of Hagar's name for God, the one who hears. The granting of justice for God's people is a revival of God's covenant to keep and protect the people of God, the God that we met in the story of Abraham and Sarah. And the God who has the power to grant justice reminds us of God's answer to Moses. I am. In any good parable, and there, are there any other kind from the mouth of Jesus, Jesus is not only telling us who God is, Jesus is also inviting us to see who we are, particularly in relationship to God. The parable is bracketed by Jesus telling his disciples that they need to pray and not lose heart at the beginning. And Jesus' question about finding any faithful ones when the Son of Man returns at the end. This parable is as much about us as it is about God. It is so tempting to take this parable and trivialize it into a story that asks very little of us. If we pray persistently, God will give us what we ask for. Amen. Let's have some coffee hour. (laughs) But this parable is told about a very specific context of petitioning God, the seeking of justice. Now, as your pastor, I will never discourage you from praying of any type. Prayer at its most basic is about relationship with God. Like a, like a child who asks a parent for a drink of water that they could get themselves, or an extra good night snuggle, even our most trivial requests to God open us up to the will and love of God in our lives. But this parable isn't about that. This story is about petitioning God for justice in an unjust world. Just before Jesus tells this story, he has been teaching about the kingdom of God. He says that the kingdom will not come with things that can be observed or even that will allow us to say, look, there it is. For Jesus tells us the kingdom of God is already among us. How much easier would it be to trust in the kingdom of God if we could clearly observe it, see it building momentum? What if the kingdom of God were more like an election and we saw the polling numbers? God ahead by a landslide. (laughs) Come November 8th, the kingdom of God will be assured. Justice for everyone. We all know that there has never been an election or a coronation of an earthly king that has brought about the fullness of the kingdom of God. We are still waiting for it to come in its fullness. This parable is telling us that our waiting is not meant to be passive. We are to petition God for justice and act for justice in order to reveal the kingdom that is here at this very moment. Our common thread story of Mary and Malarca gives us insight into what this might look like. Like Angelina said, she petitions the Ayatollah Khomeini not because she is sure it will work, but because there is nothing else for her to do but pursue justice. She approached the Ayatollah's home with shoes around her neck, a sign in Iran that she came seeking shelter and refuge. She also carried a Quran, a sign that she came in peace. At first, she was denied entry to see the Ayatollah until his son heard her cries and came to investigate. He heard her story and brought her to his father. It seems almost unbelievable that the Ayatollah, a very strict religious leader, would give Miriam permission to live as a woman. But he did. The letter he gave her, granting legal and religious permission to live as she felt called to live, not only gave her permission, but offered protection to other people in Iran who were seeking to live as transgender. Justice works like this. Any act of justice, no matter how big or small, begins to open up space for more justice until it rolls down like a river 
and an ever-gushing stream. Miriam's act of courage, her petition for justice, her deep determination made space for others to receive the justice that she sought. This parable that Jesus tells us is telling us who God is, a God who listens to the cries of God's people, who works for justice, who fulfills the covenant promise of the coming of the kingdom of God. But this parable also tells us who we should be, people that see injustices in the world and cry out to God for their healing and repair. It is so easy to become jaded. This is how it's always been. What difference can my small action make? Feeding one person won't end world hunger. Racism has always been a part of the fabric of America. How can I change that? Mass shootings are all over the news. They feel like they're happening everywhere. What could I possibly do? Jesus gives us this parable with an unjust judge who does not fear God or respect humanity and yet holds so much power. Perhaps the judge is a mirror for our world, which can feel like a cruel and heartless place sometimes, rife with injustice. And then Jesus gives us a widow, considered to be one of the most disenfranchised and powerless people in the ancient Near, Near East. Whenever the Bible features a widow, we are meant to recognize her as having almost no agency over her own life, let alone the ability to influence anyone. Yet this widow goes before the heartless judge. She stands up to his power and petitions him for justice. She does not let her own powerlessness or fear stop her, much like Miriam. She does not say to herself, widow, you have no power or agency to bring about change. Why bother petitioning this judge? Instead, she perseveres. There is no reason the widow should even voice her petition before this judge. Her case appears hopeless. But the kingdom of God is surprising in its capacity for hope and resilience. The judge hears the widow and grants her justice. Miriam's appeal to the Ayatollah is not only heard, but granted. Jesus is encouraging us to be persistent in our quest for justice and not to lose heart or hope, to put our own shoes around our neck and go forth with our Bible in our hand as a symbol of peace, to not give up in pursuing an end to houselessness and hunger, to continue to do anti-racism work, to seek a world where no student will ever die at the hands of a mass shooter again. However small our contribution, when we do this justice work with God, the kingdom is revealed in our midst. Jesus' final words in this section are a bit ominous, discouraging even. When the Son of Man returns, will he find faithfulness here on earth? Perhaps, though, these words simply represent what Jesus knows will be a long road ahead for faithful followers. The parable opens with these words. Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray and not lose heart. When we look back on the great justice movements throughout history, which of them has brought results quickly? Moses had to petition Pharaoh over and over again, and still Pharaoh's heart remained hard. The road road towards equality for black Americans began when the first enslaved person set foot on American soil hundreds of years ago and still continues today. Sarah and Abraham grew weary of waiting for Isaac to be born and gave up on God, not knowing yet that our God is a God who keeps covenant. Let us not lose heart in our quest for justice. Let us cook another meal, send another email to lawmakers, participate in one more anti-racist film club, march one more time for justice. But let us do it with God rather than alone. 
Let us keep covenant with God as God keeps covenant with us by remaining faithful in prayer to the God who promises the coming of the kingdom. Petition God over and over for the kingdom to come here on earth as it is in heaven and for justice to roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. When we are tempted to lose hope, when it seems like nothing we do will make a difference, let us remember who our God is, a covenant-keeper God, a God who hears, a God of justice, and above all else, a God of love. Amen.